Warm greetings to everyone. Thank you all for finding time to join us in today's webinar. I see that we have 120 participants signed on right now. So for those of you who do not know me, I'm Eliki Moletawa and I lead the policy programs and regional initiatives team at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Colleagues, before we start, may I ask uh, Tati to please have the slides up. Thank you very much. Thank you. So dear colleagues, dear participants that have been signed on for today, before we start, may I request everyone to observe a moment of silence, to reflect, pray, and remember all that have been impacted by this global pandemic, and in particular, the frontliners in our countries, healthcare workers, police and military, hospitality workers, and others in essential services. Thank you all so much. Participants, I now invite our Executive Director, Dr. Alfred Hennig, to provide his welcome remarks. Dr. Hennig. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, El uh, Eliki, for the introduction and also for uh, setting up this um, historic uh, meeting. I think it's the first time that we have a, a webinar of this size. I understand that you have had a few uh, of those in the past um, weeks. Um, among some of the working group members, but I think uh, this is, um, in this sense, is quite unprecedented. And I think we are very happy and, and also proud that we are able uh, to organize such a meeting um, with this number of participants all around the world. So uh, having said this, I would like to say good morning, uh, good day, good afternoon, and good evening <clears throat> to everyone who has joined us today for this global uh, webinar. And uh, welcome you really to this uh, webinar on regulatory and supervisory responses to COVID-19 with some experiences from the AFI network and beyond. And as you can see, I think we are following here um, the demand that some of our members um, have uh, brought up uh, during the past weeks when they actually uh, were wondering how are my peers, in fact, how are they um, responding to this uh, pandemic, to this economic crisis that is following the pandemic, and can we share this knowledge? So I think this is the first element uh, within the AFI response that I'm going to drill down on a little bit later. Um, let me really thank everyone uh, for the time, uh, regardless of the differences in the time zones and the circumstances, um, uh, and um, really to attend this webinar, and, and we really recognize and appreciate this effort that you're all making to be part of this. Um, it is also, uh, of course, a pleasure uh, for me really to welcome all the members. Uh, in particular, I think we also have a couple of um, heads of institutions among ourselves. I, I acknowledge the presence of Governor Caroline Abel from the Senate of the Seashells, together with our Deputy Governor Jennifer Sullivan. Um, so welcome uh, to all of you, and um, hopefully we are going to have a very productive uh, webinar. Um, when we that uh, enables us actually to walk away with uh, more uh, practical knowledge on these crisis uh, responses. Let me uh, just give you a little bit of background, but of course, um, this background that I'm giving you is nothing more than what you already can read in the news, maybe with a few um, emphasis um, that is perhaps a little bit different from what we read, but certainly um, this um, virus uh, is now. Um, spreading all over the world. We, we see an increasing number of the COVID-19 
uh, cases. But of course, what you can also see is that uh, the emphasis of the media and international reporting is very much on the uh, developed uh, countries and not so much on the developing and emerging economies. And um, on the other hand, I think uh, we now see also the, the first forecasts that this uh, health crisis that uh, rapidly turned into a dramatic economic crisis will have even more severe impact for developing countries and emerging economies uh, than for the developed countries, just because of the uh, potential uh, to respond to such uh, deep and dramatic uh, economic crisis uh, that some countries among ourselves perhaps will find it very difficult. So we're very aware that this economic downturn caused by the pandemic um, uh, will have very, or have already, has already far reaching uh, economic um, uh, effects on many of us and on all the economies we are working with. And um, I actually wanted to say that uh, many people in fact uh, argue that uh, this crisis is, is, uh, will hit uh, us harder than the financial crisis, like 12 years ago, um, which I think we can also confirm from the little that we know from our end. But um, there is another difference, which I think uh, is also something that we need to emphasize. And this is uh, the fact that other than the financial crisis, at uh, this time there is even um, the issue of social distancing. So even in the, in the current, um, uh, phase of immediate mitigation. Uh, we even have restrictions on how people can interact. So the physical interaction is of course also limited. And I think this uh, specific issue um, also shapes uh, our way forward in terms of finding the right solution. And of course, uh, you are all aware that I'm talking about um, the potential of the technology uh, that we see. Now, um, uh, so um, this is uh, the background and um, uh, uh, we, on the other hand, and I think this is uh, now starting about the opportunity. In the past 12 years, uh, since this organization is in place, uh, which as you know, coincided uh, very interestingly with the outbreak of the financial crisis of 2008, 20, uh, 2007, 2008, um, uh, 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 we actually started to see financial inclusion as an opportunity. And I wanted to highlight uh, one aspect, which I think is very important uh, to remember when we started on the financial inclusion from through AFI and even before, but then uh, systematically over the past uh, 10 to 12 years, I think we learned so much and, uh, and we already have now um, a much more mature understanding on policy solutions around financial inclusion uh, than 12 years ago when we had just started also to discover, you know, the, uh, the role and the potential of technology. 12 years down the road, I think we have made very good use of the time and we are now ready, um, in fact, maybe in a different way to uh, react to a crisis than uh, we have been like uh, 12 years uh, uh, ago. So, um, uh, and I think we are now safe to say as well, and I have actually discussed it with a couple of, of other uh, people, uh, um, maybe members even, I talked to in the past couple of days, but also um, uh, some other stakeholders. It is also uh, interesting that many of us now recognize that financial inclusion is actually one of the very few solutions that we have at hand uh, to immediately address uh, these issues that are currently hitting uh, our countries. And one point that I wanted to make, and I think when I discussed uh, with the Deputy, Deputy Executive Director, Norbert Mumba, who's also in this room, I suppose, um, this morning, I think he also mentioned uh, a very important point that I did, did not want to uh, uh, leave out from, uh, from this brief uh, intervention. Um, and what he said, I think very, very true. The crisis now is also a reminder how important uh, the implementation is and how actually in, how important our whole work stream on uh, in-country implementation is now uh, going to be. I think this is an important reminder. And of course, with all this, uh, we see a couple of things. The role of technology uh, is extremely important, especially through the social distancing issue, but also because we feel that many of the crisis responses can be brought underway through the digital channels. Then we also, of course, see um, uh, the need uh, to look at these elements uh, within the consumer protection, uh, financial education uh, frameworks that we are discussing in order to, in fact, mitigate not only the risk of this crisis, but also the risks of technology, as we have said before, um, especially when digital platforms are increasingly used. 
And then uh, there is another incredible opportunity, I think, that is just dawning upon ourselves. And this is the fact that now, with these crisis responses, in fact, we can now even uh, systematically build in uh, other policy solutions uh, that are very aligned with the sustainable development goals. In other words, our work on gender, gender inclusive finance, but also our work on green, inclusive green finance, uh, can now be very nicely embedded into this in a very systematic way and can make our responses to the crisis uh, even more uh, powerful and very um, systematic. Now, as I have said, this webinar is one of the um, deliverables within the response. Uh, we call it the response, which is actually in short for the AFI um, uh, COVID-19 uh, policy response uh, to allow our members to be informed of the experiences that members within the networks have already undertaken uh, through their own policy responses to contain or mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And this webinar will facilitate a platform for the participating institutions to discuss some of the policy and regulatory responses they have found. So that will be basically for information sharing, um, also uh, thought provoking, and of course also um, uh, encouraging you to identify those ones you find interesting and perhaps even interact with them more directly uh, later on. Um, we have already um, circulated the AFI dashboard uh, of the COVID-19 responses. Uh, many of you, especially the leaders, must have seen the letter that I have sent a couple of days ago, um, a letter that uh, not only informs you about uh, the business continuity management of AFI during this very difficult time, but also uh, have, have given you an overview of the, you know, of the various items within the response. So one is the uh, the stock taking uh, that we have already um, brought underway, the collection of these uh, re responses that you're all interested in. But we also uh, see um, activities uh, from the AFI management unit that can support you in, act in actually uh, bringing your own responses underway uh, from our angle, which is the financial inclusion angle, as you are aware. And I think here uh, we will start off with a member needs assessment very soon where we will ask you all what is your immediate demand? What is your immediate need? And on the other side, we are also trying uh, to uh, speak to some of our funders to see whether we can also mobilize additional support um, to help. There's also another silver lining I want to mention, which is also part of the uh, response uh, that we are bringing underway. Uh, we see uh, increasing flexibility on the side of the global standard setting body, such as the BCBS or the FATF. Um, and both actually have called on countries to use the flexibility in the global standard. So we'll also, of course, uh, drill down on what is possible here and then hopefully bring all this back uh, to the GPF, um, where we then also can discuss policy guidelines around COVID-19, but also the interactions of these uh, with the current uh, um, uh, global standards in this, uh, in this space. Now, uh, this webinar will allow us to gain deeper understanding on the um, of the pressing uh, issues uh, negatively impacting the countries ac across the globe and the key responses uh, that you have undertaken. So we are very much looking forward uh, uh, to this discussion. I don't want to speak too long. I'm extremely happy that we can all be together here under these circumstances. Uh, it is very nice to see that the network is so vibrant, although we are all locked down, we are all at home. I think we're all alone, uh, but uh, in a way we are together here and this is very, very, uh, uh, inspiring and uh, I think we are doing it for a very, for a very, very good purpose and I'm looking forward uh, uh, to continuing uh, the great work with you. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best and please stay in good health. Thank you so much Eliki and thank you very much dear members. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Alfred. So dear participants, I now have the pleasure to introduce and hand over to our technical moderator, Mr. Giazuddin Mohammed Ali, who is the senior Policy Manager for Digital Financial Services. But uh, prior to that, uh, just a reminder to everyone that we will send to you any relevant presentation through links. And uh, please stay tuned when this comes through. Over to you, Giaz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eliki. And thank you, Alfred, for those uh, encouraging words. Uh, warm welcome to the participants uh, of this we webinar. I'm Giaz, and I work with Eliki in the policy programs team at Alliance for Financial Inclusion. As Alfred rightly mentioned, uh, we are working on various uh, initiatives in supporting our members to come up with appropriate policy responses in the event of an outbreak. One such major initiative uh, is a network-wide dashboard on what members are doing from various perspectives 
such as digital financial services, fiscal policy initiatives, uh, stimulus packages, SME finance, so on and so forth. So we are providing in this slide, you can see a, a dashboard of uh, uh, what various member countries are doing here. Um, and you can refer to the link below to get more detailed analysis of what our member countries are doing. Uh, the reason why I showed this slide is we've collected more than 60 uh, uh, you know, examples of how countries within the network are uh, responding. And um, as, a, as a nice uh, segue from this, uh, what we wanted to do through this webinar was also to showcase some of uh, uh, the very good uh, interventions taken up by our uh, member countries. And in this webinar, uh, what we, we endeavored to do is um, as a peer learning initiative, we will showcase some of the good examples from the network and beyond. Uh, we have three examples that we intend to showcase uh, uh, in this webinar. Um, and I request uh, Tati to move to the next slide uh, uh, and allow me to introduce uh, the panelists for this uh, webinar. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Professor Douglas Erner. He is a professor of law at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, we also have Professor Dirk Zetsche. He is Professor of Law and Inclusive Finance at University of Luxembourg. So both of the, uh, the professors, experts, academics will provide a global perspective on um, how the outbreak has impacted the economies, both in developed and emerging market economies, uh, um, and what are the possible options uh, for, for regulators and uh, uh, financial supervisors. We also have representatives from three member countries. We have uh, Moncolo Biani, Assistant Director of uh, Regulatory Policy from the Bank of Zambia. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sethor Amadiku. He is the Director of Payment Systems at uh, Bank of Ghana. And we also have Mr. Stephen Ambore. He is the Head of Digital Financial Services Unit at the Central Bank of uh, Nigeria. Uh, now, without further ado, let me invite uh, Professor Douglas uh, to provide a broader uh, big picture perspective on how COVID is impacting uh, emerging market economies from a macro and micro perspective and how should policymakers uh, react to it. Uh, so before that, let me run through the, uh, the agenda quickly, the running agenda for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so we will have a broad input provided by Professor D Douglas, a thematic uh, a presentation, and then we'll go on uh, specific thematic areas related to MSME uh, presented by uh, Monkolo from Bank of Zambia, of Zambia, and then on digital financial services from Bank of Ghana and Nigeria, uh, Central Bank of Nigeria. And uh, we will get a, a more nuanced, developed and advanced country response uh, from Professor Dirk Zetche. Uh, so this will be during their first intervention, which will be for about four to five minutes. Um, and then we will have a, a, a round of panel discussion, and then we'll open up uh, for Q&A. Uh, but I request uh, uh, colleagues who have joined in to uh, contribute your thoughts, suggestions, and also if any questions, if any, um, to, to kind of type in as, uh, as you get so that I can record them and ask the panelists accordingly. So with that said, I'll hand over the floor to uh, Professor uh, Douglas Erner. Over to you, sir, for about five to six minutes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Giaz. And uh, also thanks to, to Eliki uh, and, and, uh, and Alfred uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, if you would, Tati, next slide, please. And maybe one more. Good. Um, you know, I think when we're looking at the current situation, the first piece that we have to realize is that we still have no clear picture of how this is going to, to develop over time. But I think what we do understand very well now is that in the developed countries, and so far, if you think of uh, the sort of evolution of this crisis, it it's it's moved from, uh, from China to Iran, to Italy, to South Korea, to most of the EU, to the United States, to the UK. And I think we can safely say increasingly uh, to developing countries around the world. And I think it's an early stage to, to say exactly what 
the overall human or, or economic impact is going to be. But it is very clear now that this is uh, a very significant human uh, and economic shock. Next slide, please, Tat. I think when we think about finance and, and financial inclusion, I think Alfred has made some very, very strong points. And the first of those really is that for countries that have spent efforts in building systems, particularly digital systems to support financial inclusion, these can be very valuable as this situation proceeds. And we're already seeing this uh, in the countries which have been impacted so far. I think the second thing that we know very much, and um, my colleagues, uh, Dirk Zetsch at the University of Luxembourg, Ross Buckley uh, at the University of New South Wales, and I, I have a long-term focus on the interaction between um, the financial sector and the broader economy. And that means in good times, how can we help the financial sector function better to support the real economy? In bad times, how can we minimize the damage and prevent crises from happening to the greatest extent possible? And what that means is that sometimes we're working on crises, sometimes uh, we're working on better periods. And I think what we can safely say from looking at crises is that in any financial or economic or human crisis, the groups that are impacted the most significantly are those least able to bear it. And certainly from the standpoint uh, of financial inclusion and from our wider objectives around achieving the sustainable development goals, the risks of the current crisis are tremendous. And so from the standpoint of finance, what can we do? And I think very much, a lot of effort is being spent talking about comparing this crisis to the 2008 crisis. And for me, that's not necessarily very useful because 2008 was primarily a financial crisis that evolved into a wider economic crisis emerging from the developed countries and widely spreading through trade and financial channels across the developing world. This crisis is not primarily a financial crisis. It's primarily a human crisis. That human and health crisis is becoming an economic crisis and the impact on the health, human and economic side risks turning this into a financial crisis. So from the standpoint of addressing the current situation, next slide please, Taddy. I think really the first standpoint is making sure that the financial sector functions. Because if the financial sector functions, then that enables us to use financial inclusion and other tools to support um, reducing the human, reducing the economic impact. If, however, we see the financial crisis fail or financial pro we see the financial system fail or financial problems emerge, this will then uh, make other problems worse. So really, what is the starting point? And my real role today is to try to provide a framework of analysis to help you think through what you're dealing with. And really, when we're looking at this, we look at it on four different levels. The first level is addressing the financial impact. The second is addressing the economic impact. The third is possibly having a role in the health equation. The fourth is looking forward. And I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on each of those. From the financial sector standpoint, our starting point is the financial infrastructure. If the payment system, if securities markets, if these things work, this is a very important foundation for dealing with everything else. And this is why we've spent decades working on this infrastructure. What is somewhat different in this crisis is that we also have to be very concerned about another type of infrastructure, and that's the central bank itself. We have to think about the risks to central bank staff from the standpoint of a possible failure, not only of the payment or other sorts of financial infrastructure, but in the context of the central bank itself. So that is the first stage, the infrastructure. The second stage is really about liquidity. Liquidity to try to keep individuals, businesses, financial intermediaries 
And as this crisis progresses, governments having sufficient financial resources to conduct their functions in addressing the health impact. And that means that from the standpoint of the financial sector, from the standpoint of authorities, it's very essential to focus on liquidity. That is availability, access, usage to make sure that people, the financial institutions, businesses, and the government can actually access finance. Third, the financial institutions themselves. And this is both from the solvency side as well as from the standpoint uh, of contingency planning, of essentially how they plan for their own crisis response, the sorts of things we've been looking at since September 11th, 2001. Moving from this framework, it's really about our response. And that is where the financial sector comes in, in thinking about how can we begin targeting an economic response to get us through the crisis period and eventually begin recovering. And what is that about? It's about e-commerce. To the extent that we are looking at lockdowns, those places which have systems to provide support or access, this is going to make that much easier. If you don't have that, it's very useful to begin thinking about now how you can work with communications providers, uh, payment services providers, financial institutions, your own national payment system, to think about how you might be able to put something together that you can actually use to get fundamental resources like food and water to people who may not, for a variety of health reasons, be able to go out for an extended period of time. And one thing that is lucky a bit in this crisis is that the developing countries are more or less getting hit last. What that means is even though this is moving on all of you quite quickly, you have a little bit more time to watch and to start moving as it comes. And many of you have already done that. So the second after e-commerce is thinking about directed financial support. How can you get financial support to individuals, to SMEs? to businesses, to financial institutions. And this is something that we'll see some examples about as we discuss, and certainly Dirk will talk later about the EU. It's something where in a country where you are thinking about cash transfers or you're thinking about checks, the inefficiencies and the dangers in those bring with them real risk. And finally, government services. If you have an infrastructure that allows electronic payments, you have widespread access to accounts, that provides you a fundamental framework to use a wide range of government services, including relating to health services. Now, as we get into health, those sorts of frameworks potentially to think about how can you have distance access to healthcare? How can you provide limited health resources that will maximize what you have across a larger population? How can you potentially track? How can you use financial systems to try to get resources to the health system? And this is emerging as one of the biggest problems. Now, looking forward, where are the considerations? Well, the first is all of this digitization brings with it risks, infrastructure risks, privacy risks, cybersecurity risks, consumer protection risks. And this is something that is growing very, very rapidly as we turn increasingly to these sorts of digital frameworks. Second, funding. Can we use digital finance to mobilize funding from around the world? And it is something that we are already seeing. It's something that can be used much more effectively. Now, going forward, we don't know at this point what the world is going to look like coming out of this crisis. It may not be that different. It may be very different. And that is something that we're going to have to continue thinking about as we move forward. But as Alfred highlighted, I think it's important to realize that financial inclusion plays a very important role in addressing this sort of crisis. So to the extent that we can think about as we make responses, how can those potentially reinforce systems for financial inclusion and potentially wider achievement of the SDGs, this is very important. Likewise, we're already seeing at the international level, 
the FATF, for instance, saying that FinTech, RegTech, should be used to the greatest extent possible. Very important statements. And finally, as we think forward, what sort of world do we potentially have? But the key to having that world is thinking about how to prevent the human and economic crisis from becoming a financial crisis. How can we use financial tools to try to reduce the economic and human impact going forward? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Douglas, for sticking to the time um, and for that useful intervention. Uh, I have a quick follow-up question, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Anna. Uh, from a fintech perspective, uh, which use cases do you think are most ripe or relevant in the event of this crisis? Do you have some examples uh, that you can quote, please? Thank you. I mean, I think clearly the one that is most important is electronic payment. And to the extent that um, electronic payment is combined with widespread availability of accounts tied to digital IDs, as we've highlighted in the FinTech for Financial Inclusion strategy, that I think is key. But if I had to focus on one thing more than anything else, it would be electronic payments. And to the extent that you haven't already done so, if you don't have uh, a sort of interoperable national electronic payment system, what you need to be doing now is getting together the major actors which provide electronic payments. The telecoms companies, mobile payments providers, financial institutions, the national payment system, and basically figuring out a way in a very short period of time to be able to get financial resources through those channels to as many people as you possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another very interesting question, very useful question from uh, J.G. Brown. Uh, with the crisis spanning across the entire world and low-income countries have traditionally depended on developed high-income countries for financing, uh, what are practical options of ensuring the provision of some sort of financing to targeted groups? Are there special funding options available somewhere that uh, the emerging market economies can tap on? What are the new sources of funding uh, for uh, you know, managing the, the negative impacts of this uh, crisis actually? Over yeah. the dollars? I mean, I think the key is because the major economies, and so rather than saying developed economies, I think I can safely say major economies because we're talking about China as well. Um, the major economies have been very focused uh, on their own problems. And of course, from a geopolitical standpoint, the conflicts over healthcare goods uh, are, are really quite shocking that we're seeing uh, at an international level. So I think relying on the major economies is probably not going to be the path forward in this case. Um, rather, I think where we are seeing, uh, I guess, some good news, one is that China's experience indicates that it does in. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are back to normal, but at least the worst part of the crisis does in. And so you are then seeing major economies, China first, as they move through the acute phase of the crisis, then begin to think more broadly. And so I think that's one. The second is I think we're seeing a very strong response from the international organizations, including AFI. But in particular, uh, I think the World Bank and the IMF have come forward with uh, some very strong resources. And it's probably handy that both have somewhat different management at the moment. Uh, and so I think the IMF is going to be a key source in providing support for economies facing solvency issues. I think the World Bank, the various development banks are going to be key sources of funding and increasingly the foundation. I think we lost Douglas there um, till the time he sets his... Uh, uh... I think we may have lost Giaz actually here. Yeah, I think he's, uh, 
connection must have been playing up. So uh, I think there's another question here uh, for you, Professor. Uh, what is the special attention or measures we should take in consideration, particularly for the MFIs? Yeah, I think the key points in, in thinking about the MFIs are largely the same as uh, we were looking at earlier. To first think about the infrastructure to make sure that that functions. Second, to think about liquidity. How can they access liquidity? And third, think about their potential risks from a solvency standpoint. In other words, from an MFI standpoint, where it's solvency risks, its risks are that its borrowers, individuals and SMEs cannot repay its loans. And so therefore you're thinking about both liquidity targeting the, F, the, the MFIs themselves, but you're also thinking about how can you provide financial support for individuals and SMEs to prevent essentially what is uh, a sudden stop in the economy from turning into a financial crisis. And we have to realize that we're facing something very unusual, which is a full economic stop. And we're going to have to think about ways to try to the greatest extent possible to bridge that with finance. And in many developing countries around the world, I expect that along with the e-payments providers, the MFIs are going to be a key conduit in the crisis response. So in other words, bringing them in at an early stage to basically figure out how can they not only be supplied with resources, but also how can they be used to get resources where your key problems are. Thank you, uh, uh, Keliki. And thank you, Douglas, for uh, that response. This uh, provides a nice uh, segue to invite my next speaker, uh, Ms. Monkolo Biani from the Bank of Zambia, uh, to share perspectives on the impact of MSMEs because of the outbreak and how should uh, regulators react. She will also present the case of Bank of uh, uh, Zambia. Uh, colleagues, before I hand over to Monkolo, I should also mention that Monkolo is the chair of SME Finance Working Group at AFI and is very rightly placed to uh, provide us with some uh, best practices and examples on how it will affect the MSME sector. Over to you, Monkolo, for the next five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gians. Uh, <clears throat> maybe as I start my presentation, I should just start by mentioning that um, many countries have uh, made so much strides towards uh, improving financial inclusion but unfortunately, the world now is faced with a big elephant in the house, COVID-19. And I think as uh, Alfred said in his opening remarks, even Douglas, we had the financial crisis, but when you look at the impact of COVID-19, it's probably more severe than uh, the financial crisis uh, that we had. And uh, from my perspective, I'll, I'll limit my discussion to the impact of COVID-19 on the MSME uh, sector. Tati, if you could just uh, move the slides, yes. And uh, I, as most of you, my colleagues are very much aware, MSMEs have always been the most vulnerable sector to financial and economic shocks than most of their corporate uh, counterparts. Whenever there's any shock in the economy, it's the MSMEs. If the MSMEs need to grow their businesses, they are unable to access any finance. If the MSMEs says need to grow their businesses, everybody just shuts them out. Now with the COVID-19, we've seen that there's been a slowdown and uh, in some cases a shutdown on the large corporates. And this has actually has had uh, cascading effects on the MSMEs because a number of them are related to the large corporates. And this has resulted in a massive uh, demand and supply shock for the MSME sector. And this is why it is very, very important for regulators to pay attention to this uh, sector because really this is the engine of all economies as it has been recognized in uh, most uh, literature. We all know there's been a lockdown in most uh, countries. There's been a loss of market for the, for the MSMEs. Nobody wants to go to their little corner shops. There's poor ventilation. Their packaging is probably uh, not as good as anybody would be so comfortable with. And therefore this has reduced uh, the demand for their goods, 
resulting re in reduced sales, reduced cash flows, and really ultimately losses. And some of them have already closed down within this short space of the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, if we look at uh, what is happening, do we see any prospects of financial assistance or bailout for MSMEs? I think the question, the answer is very slim because even before this crisis, the MSMEs have always been considered to be a very risky sector with high defaults. There's a lot of information asymmetry with the financial service providers and therefore even bailout for them at this moment seems uh, to be very slim. Next slide, Tati. So how are the MSMEs expected to be affected during this COVID uh, pandemic. As I have said, there's been production constraints. Most of them have had their finances really affected. You find you've got a shop, you have to pay your rentals, you have to pay your workers, you have to order your supplies. At the end of the day, your finances run out. Where do you turn to for further financing? Nowhere. So this has really constrained their production. As I have said, again, there's challenges to access to financial resources. There's been a, a supply chain disruption also. If you look at most of the MSMEs, they deal in low value products and they specialize on, on turnovers and their profit margins are very, very small. Therefore, they typically don't have storage facilities. They really buy, they sell and go and buy and resell again. Therefore, the supply chain has been disrupted. Typically, they have shortages. They can't stock up their shops to sell. So again, this, is, this has affected their businesses. As I have said, there's loss of market with the lockdown. Most people are now staying at home. Very few people are going to the shops, let alone the smaller ones, to go and buy any groceries. Therefore, there's a lo loss of market for them. From a policy intervention perspective, are there any, is there any hope again for them? Very few countries uh, world over have uh, targeted uh, initiatives for MSMEs. And therefore during this period, we see that most of the MSMEs may not be able to navigate through the crisis because uh, the support is very, very little in most countries. The MSMEs really survive on their own. They borrow from their families and from their friends to support their businesses. Next slide. And then uh, policy interventions by the Bank of Zambia. I'll draw down to what we have done as the Bank of Zambia to mitigate the crisis, especially to help the MSME sector. I must uh, hasten to mention that uh, the Bank of Zambia has put in place quite a number of measures. These are not specifically tailored as, at uh, MSMEs. Zambia is still developing a policy to help uh, MSMEs but most of the policies that the Bank of Zambia has uh, put in place are expected to have trickle-down effects to the MSMEs because we realize the importance of these sectors. And I'll just quickly run you through some of the measures that we have uh, put in place. We have uh, relaxed our loan provisioning and classification rules for all our financial service providers. You know that previously we had stringent uh, rules and this really impacted the capital position of the FSAP, FSPs. Therefore, during this uh, period, we have relaxed, not that we have waived them, there has to be qualifying criteria just to give relief to all the FSPs during this time. And for the microfinance institutions, the MSMEs, in fact, for them, their classification and provisioning criteria are more stringent. So we hope that with the relaxation in, in these uh, rules, they will actually get to benefit. We have also allowed for restructuring of credit facilities. Our regulatory uh, framework previously did allow for this, but now again, we have provided further guidance to see how we can, the financial service providers can actually help, you know, defaulting or distressed uh, facilities to be restructured. But again, this has to meet qualifying criteria. We don't want to make a, to find ourselves in a crisis after relaxing some of these rules that we have put in place. And then uh, we have also seen uh, the introduction of fee holiday 
payment holiday. And we are glad to say that this actually, this initiative has come from uh, our financial service providers themselves. And we really applaud the private sector in our country because they've really partnered with the central bank and with the governance, they with the government. They have realized that it's no longer business as usual. Yes, they are in business to make profit, but for now, we have to help our economy. We have to support the resilience of our financial sector, and we have to help our economy. So there are some few holidays that have been uh, introduced during this period. We have also seen an upward adjustment of mobile money transaction limits, especially for the MSMEs and small scale farmers, because most of these really don't use the conventional banking uh, method. So these are some of the measures that we have put in place. There's enhanced risk management, and there's been liquidity support to the financial providers, which we hope is going to cascade down to the MSMEs. Next slide, please. And then uh, there's a question that I was asked the readiness of uh, policy institutions to respond effectively to COVID-19 crisis, the world over. Are policy institutions ready to respond? And uh, what lessons can we draw from what has happened? For me, what I'm saying now is that COVID-19 came like a thief in the night. Nobody expects a thief, but it came like a thief in the night. We have had risk management processes, stress testing models, but all these have been defeated and the effects have been very unprecedented. And what am I recommending as an individual? I think this calls for diversification of our economies internally and externally. We are a global village, but you find that some of our countries are so much import dependent. I'll give an example. For us in Zambia, most of our SMEs, they are cross-border traders and they get their merchandise from China and South Africa. And these two countries have been greatly, greatly affected. There's a lockdown. So what happens to these cross-border traders? They have to shut down. And I think one of the other measures that I think we should consider as uh, policymakers is to invest in virtual banking. We've always for a long time depended on cash, cash. We talk about cashless economies. And then also for the regulators, we have to continually review our regulatory models. Our regulatory models should not be cast in concrete. When there's need to modify, let us modify and amend to, afford, to avoid any further damage. But of course, this should be done very cautiously and carefully. Next slide, which I think is my next... Um, well, we have we have got a lot of questions coming in, so you might want to uh, uh, finish fast so that I can cover yes, the questions. This is my last slide. I'll leave the rest for the questions. I, I think I was also, also asked to see which sectors in our, our country, really, and in a number of jurisdictions in our area have been affected. For us in Zambia, as I said, a number of our MSMEs are cross-border traders. So as I have said, they've been affected. Our tourism industry has greatly... You know, the Victoria Falls is a major income earner, and this time of the year, we've got great waters, but there are no tourists coming in, so it's a wasted resource. The hospitality industries, the hotels are empty, the restaurants are empty, the small shop owners, the street vendors, the hawkers and the marketeers, these have all been affected. Are there any mitigation measures? Yes. Let's encourage our MSMEs to diversify their businesses. Do not put all your eggs in one basket. If you sell vegetables, try to sell fruit as well. And also, I think there's need to enhance market infrastructure in terms of communication, transport, e-markets, and even also to consider micro insurance for the MSMEs sector. I think I'll, I'll end there and uh, leave the rest for any questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mankolo. Um, so one question that we've come, uh, we've uh, we've had is from uh, uh, Moise Biri, Bikirimana. She says he says uh, low-income people are hit hard by COVID-19. These low-income people had loans in microfinance institutions, and they are likely to default. What measures should be taken to rescue MFIs? and probably other financial in institutions that are likely to fail due to COVID-19. 
quick response from you. It's going to be my next slide, but I knew it was going to be a question. You know, ideally, when you look at uh, microfinance institutions, they are really there to support the entrepreneurs, you know, the recipients of their funds. They are there to help them to build their business capacity, to make them more resilient, and to engage in sustainable activities. But unfortunately, we have seen most of these MFIs go into the business of the conventional banks, you know, where there is heightened risk. And therefore, when you look at the microfinance uh, institutions, I think the support, one of the areas that I think should really be supported is the women. You know, most of the women are the ones that lead the families. They are the breadwinners in the homes. Most of the MSMEs are female-led. So for me, it's not about giving them money. The help could be about restructuring their facilities and agree on a feasible and a reasonable repayment periods to see how best they can help them. And a quick follow-up on, on that. How can digitization help to mitigate the effects of crisis, especially for uh, uh, microfinance institutions, but also to MSMEs, actually? Yeah. I think one of the challenges that we noticed here in Zambia was uh, when we started putting up in place measures to counter this COVID-19, the commercial banks are very advanced. They've got mobile banking, ATMs, internet banking. But when you look at most of these uh, microfinance uh, institutions, they have not invested so much in technology. And I think this is a wake up call now. And this is where the regulators and the supervisory authorities really have to press hard. There's need for digitization of transactions, automation of processes as much as possible to have contactless transactions so that it will continue to be business as usual for the microfinance sector as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mankolo. We have many questions. Uh, I'll come back to you later. But uh, a general question that we are getting is many of the measures that uh, uh, we as central banks are taking are short term. But what about medium term to long term? What about uh, after the crisis, after COVID-19, uh, what what should we take? What should we do? And how how should the measures that we take now affect after the crisis? That's a question that uh, I will ask to all the panelists uh, maybe later. Uh, but for now, I'll move to the next uh, two interventions uh, that are related to uh, responses to COVID-19 from a digital financial services perspective. And we will start uh, with Mr. Uh, Dr. Sethor from Bank of Ghana where he's the director of Payment Systems Department. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sethor. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And let me use this opportunity to uh, really uh, thank Afi for organizing this innovative uh, arrangement to coordinate and then uh, disseminate uh, policy intervention at this critical moment, and especially those who, are, who were able to help in putting this program together. It's very timely for knowledge sharing. Now, globally, um, policy responses have come from monetary and fiscal measures and promotion of digital services to replace cash. As the World Health Organization has rightly stated, cash will serve as a conduit of trans transmission of the viruses. So they are promoting or encouraging countries to promote digital services. We have also noticed that uh, there are realization of provision in payment laws and promotion of contactless payment. Let me add that uh, Professor Douglas submission at the earlier stage really summarized the key initiatives that each country needs to assess when you want to implement timely uh, policy interventions at this moment. One key issue that um, we at the Bank of Ghana, we have taken into consideration in evolving our policy to respond to this COVID-19 is first of all, look at the underprivileged, the informal sector. And then the next thing is to recognize that this COVID-19 is a human and health uh, uh, crisis. And how can we use our structures to overcome these challenges, to ameliorate or reduce the suffering of our people? Then the next thing we also uh, we were concerned about was the, the security of our staff and the financial services industry. Next slide. 
Now, we will now specifically look at the policy intervention Bank of Ghana has put in place to help address these three key areas that Prof Professor Dogra has already identified. Next slide. Now, the first thing we did that was in March, early March, was that we realized that majority of our people are in the informal sector, despite the various policy intervention we might have implemented in the past. So we quickly came together with the stakeholders and we agreed among ourselves that uh, all transactions between one and 100 Ghana City, which is about $20, uh, should be treated free. Formally, they were attracting in, uh, interest uh, uh, rate of fee, commission fees of 1%. Now, what that means is that now every Ghanaian can do transfer of funds of $20 without being paying commissions or fees. This is to promote a, a cashless economy and to encourage people to send money to people who are, who are in distress. Let me add also that, as you are all aware, we have a well-developed interoperability platform, as uh, Professor Douglas also highlighted in his uh, earlier presentation. Around this time, it became clear that there's a need for every country to ensure that all the payment platform and system payment streams are interoperable so that funds can move uh, around in the economy in order to promote the social distancing recommendation. The next thing we did was to encourage all those who have mobile phone. Now mobile phone accounts or mobile phone numbers now serve as a basic account to assess mini work KYC accounts in Ghana. The overall idea is to ensure that everybody who has mobile phone, we have mobile phone penetration over 134% in Ghana, as a way of giving people hope, opportunity, to use basic digital services. So uh, we have seen in the numbers also with the introduction of this policy, majority of our people are now sending or they have now subscribed to the basic mini work KYC and they are now moving funds around. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Ne Next slide. I, uh, I, now, think I think I can go on. Yes, yes, uh, Professor, please go on uh, while we fix the slides. In detail, we have also relaxed um, the transaction limits. Mm -hmm. uh, our transaction limits for the various three KYC accounts have been enhanced between over 100% to 500%. Uh, and let me add that as a result of the COVID-19, um, formally, you do this transaction with very restricted limit with concern with AML issues. But in the short term, because of the COVID-19 challenges, we have decided as a country that we to enhance this transaction limit to encourage people to use this digital means instead of using uh, uh, cash. And our medium, and enhanced KYC now don't have limits, meaning they are like a bank grade accounts that you can use to transfer uh, 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 funds in Ghana. Another innovative uh, uh, arrangement Ghana has put in place is that uh, we have introduced universal QR code, universal QR code which allow uh, contactless payment and this is interoperable among our banks uh, mobile money providers, our ATMs, as a way of reducing reliance on usage of cash. And we have also agreed with uh, digital credit providers, based on my earlier uh, colleague from uh, Zambia, he was talking about what can each country do for the SMEs as a way of ensuring that they survive at this critical moment. One of the initiatives we have implemented at this critical moment is that we came to an arrangement with digital credit providers. Uh, and these credits are for the vulnerable, that they should provide mor moratorium. So what is happening is that digital service providers have provided moratorium between three to six months for all these underprivileged people not to pay for the credits that they have taken. 
and interest payments are being held until we see how this COVID-19 play out. Another term that we have also agreed with the digital credit provided is that uh, we have also agreed that they should also look at the credit levels that they were previously offering to the, uh, the recipients, the, this recipient group. A majority of them has also enhanced the various threshold and that is very handy for these people. One key issue about this digital credit is that majority of the people who access this digital credit, they, they are people who do daily labor work, for example, mason, carpentries, uh, gardeners, and then the, those who serve by, uh, by the traffic light. And then by the end of the day, they pay back this digital credit. However, as a result of the lockdown, Ghana is really locked down now. As a result of the lockdown, most of these people cannot go out to go and uh, work to come and pay for this credit. So there must be a way to ensure that the little money they have in their mobile money wallet are not taken away by these deductions. And we have come into agreement with the service providers that they should put moratorium on the deduction of this uh, uh, credit that this vulnerable group has borrowed. Now, Ghana has also recently launched, that was in March, another product that uh, encouraged people to use their mobile money account to access bank services uh, without not having a bank account, which we call ProZPay. And this is interoperable. It's a way of ensuring that since people cannot go to the banking hall, because almost all our banking halls are closed, only few bank branches are open. People can be in the comfort of their home, use their mobile money uh, uh, number to open a bank account and to transact basic uh, 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 services. And uh, let me say that uh, apart from all this, there are other macro policies that uh, we have uh, implemented uh, with respect to uh, providing additional liquidity support for our banks. We have relaxed our capital buffer for banks. We have also reduced uh, our classification of loans. And then we have also gone further to reduce primary reserve requirement for banks. What this means is that banks are now being given additional liquidity to lend. Uh, it's a way of ensuring that banks have enough resources to lend at this critical moment. And one thing let me add is that currently in my department, we have only four staff out of the 30 that we have. And the work we are doing here, even though there is a lockdown, to ensure that we encourage service providers to digitally transfer credit to those who are in need of credit. And this credit is being offered not only by mobile money operators, even banks. For example, salary workers who cannot go to uh, their banks uh, to assess credit are now assessing credit uh, through digital means without not going through the normal processes. These are all means to ensure that we keep our people, even though under the lockdown situation, we keep them active and they have access to basic means and then we will assess the situation as it is placed out. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sator. One quick question uh, that we have from uh, Akhtam uh, uh, from Central Bank of Jordan. Um, what, what do you think is the major risk that payment system providers and central banks should pay attention to during the crisis to maintain integrity of financial and payment systems actually? Mm -hmm. So from a resilient standpoint, what are the, what, I mean, what risks do you see and what resilience uh, uh, interventions are you taking in order to ensure integrity of financial and payment systems? Dr. Seto? Yeah, the key risk that we have identified is cyber. Mm -hmm. And we have brought all PSPs, including the banks, mm -hmm. into a platform whereby we get daily reports from our people. Because currently I'm speaking, most of our staff are working from home. And this information is made, there are a lot of transfer of information. At the same time also, a lot of people are now online trying to access financial services. And just like a report I was reading this morning, if you look at current trends, global trends, you could see that 
there are a lot of cyber incidents around this time because a lot of criminals have realized that most of banking transactions or financial transactions have moved online. So what we are doing as a central bank is that uh, good for us, we have a very good framework, cyber framework already in place before this crisis. And we have an arrangement for information, information sharing. We have our ISO office. We have the national uh, 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 set center that give daily information sharing, mm -hmm. which is helping to identify some of these threats to ensure that service availability, as uh, Professor Douglas also stated earlier on, service availability is assured our people. Because around this critical time, if we can get financial services running, then the confidence in the financial system may be undermined. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one quick follow-up question to that is, uh, now that you've uh, relaxed uh, the transaction limits and uh, reduced uh, the fees, there are waivers, so on and so forth, has, has there been any impact, uh, positive or negative, in terms of uh, volume and value of transactions, uh, Dr. Sethor? Um, yes, uh, we, have, uh, we have, the data we have now has shown that within the first week, Transaction volumes has gone up about 45 percent, as per the the new policy measures that we have uh, introduced. And we are tracking this data on a, a weekly basis. Currently, we are working on the last week data. It just shows the majority of people are now assess, assessing digital credit as a result of the central bank policy intervention. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, I'll move to the next. Uh, uh, panelists and uh, we, we can come to the questions in, in due time. Uh, I, I would now like to request uh, Stephen Ambore uh, from the Central Bank of Nigeria, he heads the DFS unit there, uh, to provide his intervention, quick uh, four minute intervention. Over to you Stephen, thank you. All right, um, thank you very much. Colleagues, are we able to hear Stephen? No. Uh, Stephen, maybe you can switch off the video, Stephen, and try uh, uh, the audio option. While, uh, while Stephen is trying to fix his uh, uh, internet, maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Sethor one very uh, important question that came in. Uh, the, measure, the measures such as uh, increasing limits and making downward adjustments on fees on mobile money and other digital transactions is good. And we have implemented Hello? in Liberia. However, my question is, would it be appropriate to also place restrictions Hello? on the use of cash during this period, such as lowering cash withdrawal limits or introducing cash withdrawal charges? Your take on this, Dr. Sethor, while, while uh, Stephen is coming on board. Um, Gail, just to let you know, I'm back. Oh, fantastic. Uh, let, me, let me get the response from uh, Dr. Sethor and uh, we'll have you on. You're on mute, Dr. Sethor. You're on mute, Dr. All right. Sethor. Uh, in, maybe I hear the question very well. Uh, in Ghana, uh, let me use Ghanaian situation to answer that question. Currently, Ghanaians are not allowed to come out. Mm -hmm. They are allowed to come out for only basic uh, needs, such as food, gas, and uh, other uh, health. Mm -hmm. And we are encouraging our people to digitally transact. And let me say that uh, as a result of this crisis, Bank of Ghana has relaxed most of these provisions to ensure that people get access to financial services. We are not in normal times. And nobody even know when this crisis, how this crisis and when this crisis will play out. So what we need now is to ensure that our systems are working up to the time when the, the global economy 
can move out of this crisis. I think those are the key issue. So the realization of transaction demand, fees, waiver, these are in temporary measures to ensure that as those who are sick are being attended to, people who are alive can have access to basic services to ensure the economies are moving before the whole global economy move out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. If you look at the various readings, people are projecting May, people are projecting June, people are projecting July. Nobody knows when this will end. And as a central bank, what you need to do is that you ensure one, your infrastructure are available, robust, and timely, meeting the timely needs of your people. At the same yes. time, two institutions are resilient. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now uh, go to uh, Stephen, but before I go to Stephen, I will ask the attendees uh, to provide their inputs on, uh, to this question. Uh, do you think it is fair to provide disincentives for uh, get, gaining access to cash? Disincentives could be in terms of uh, uh, increasing the, the withdrawal charges or uh, doing away with any withdrawals at agent outlets, so on and so forth. Do you think uh, that is fair? Uh, do you think that should be done in, during this crisis? You may answer in a yes or a no uh, the, in the chat bar. I now uh, go over to Stephen, uh, over to you for about four minutes. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much again, Giaz and, and, and everyone. Just um, quickly, a little context about um, Nigeria and, and, and COVID. So we have 37 states in Nigeria. Um, the two states that I hit um, most, very interestingly, is Abuja and Lagos. And if you understand Nigeria, um, Lagos is the financial capital. Almost all financial services headquarter in, are headquartered in Lagos, and almost all the regulators are headquartered in um, Abuja. So we have um, a supply side issue in terms of um, 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 COVID. Um, the demand side, not, not, not as much um, um, heat. Um, in terms of numbers and financial inclusion, um, just 2018, um, Nigeria recorded 63.2% financial inclusion for its 96.6 million um, adults. It still means 36.6 million um, adults are still financially excluded. That's more than the entire population of Ghana and, and 2x the population of um, Zambia, just to put it in, in context. Um, instant payment is very popular um, in Nigeria. We've seen increase in volume from 4.4 million in 2012 to 504 million in 2019. And as a matter of fact, in terms of value, it is the biggest payment channel in, in Nigeria um, currently. So there's a lot of reliance on, on instant payment. However, um, DSS penetration in Nigeria is increasingly, is, is, is uh, interestingly, very low. For instance, based on statistics we have, mobile money penetration in Nigeria is still at 3.3%. As a matter of fact, the awareness of mobile money is at 18%. Um, there are a lot of policies that we rolled out as a nation to drive digital financial services. I'm not going to go um, um, detailed into them, but mobile money, super agents, payment system service provider, payment system bank, and we basically are discussing with fintechs on the best way for them to come in. Um, because of the increased reliance of um, DFS and to facilitate um, participation, because we have two issues. We have the issue of adoption of DFS and we have the issue of you know, at, um, access point for financial um, um, services. So to facilitate that, one issue that we had was pricing. On one side, viability of pricing for the supply side. And on the other side, um, customers, consumers were complaining of high cost. So in December, um, the bank did a big thing and brought down significantly almost all costs related to DFS. So basically, um, um, like we had an admonition, admonition that something was going to happen and basically worked on our DFS prices across the board and revised our guide to bank charges and significantly brought DFS. Um, down now. How is the Central Bank of Nigeria viewing um, COVID-19? We view it as a health issue and an economic issue. And the Central Bank of Nigeria focuses heavily on 
on um, development finance functions. The Central Bank of Nigeria provides uh, facilities for a lot of MSMEs. As a matter of fact, 1.4 million farmers are currently enjoying such benefit from the Central Bank of Nigeria. So our reaction, basically, because um, MSMEs employ about 60-something percent of Nigerians, so we're basically very interested in, in the sector. And just to mention that for every intervention we do, we leverage on, on digital services to provide such intervention for the end beneficiary. So in terms of direct intervention for COVID, um, the bank gave a one-year moratorium on all CBN facilities. Um, it reduced interest rate by 4%, and it provided a 50 billion Naira um, targeted credit facility for households and SMEs that are really impacted by this. And it kind of opened up for the bank to provide regulatory forbearance for banks to be able to restructure um, their loans and, and, and also provide 100 billion Naira healthcare um, um, facility and another 1 trillion Naira to boost local um, um, manufacturing. What is happening here is not just the central bank, it's a collaboration between the private sector and government because this is central bank and the bankers committee to, to address this. Now, how is this playing out? Of course, um, we have DFS operating for people that are already in the former financial services. It is facilitating speed of transaction and it is helping everybody stay at home. The way everybody is expected to stay at home. But we're having issues um, in terms of the last mile. Because of depth of infrastructure, we rely heavily on agents. We have a target of rapidly deploying half a uh, million agents before the end of the year. But basically, agents in a lot of locations are affected. And it brings to the conversation um, financial services like central bank and um, the private sector, they have very robust business continuity plan that have been tested over the years and they can use to respond to any kind of crisis that comes like this current one. The question is, we've been driving the implementation of agents and fringe players like FinTech. In mm -hmm. times like this, how mm -hmm. does business continuity planning play out for them? This is a new terrain and it's an obvious challenge. Um, one issue that people have for adoption of digital financial services, mobile financial services, and, and agent generally is trust. So now they are getting to trust these agents. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, mm -hmm. they are not as accessible as they should. But these agents will have liquidity challenges. They will have challenges because they do not have a DCP of this skill. You know? So this is pretty much saying something. We talk a lot about appropriate regulation for fintech. It is time we should start bringing the issue of appropriate business continuity planning for people that provide financial services at the base of the pyramid. And it is time to start looking at agents, especially Kiko agents, as an integral part of the payment system and financial system infrastructure, not just as an addendum. This view will help um, organizations plan this. Um, 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 we have some things on ground. We, we, we think consumer redress we still keep coming because based on what we've seen, cybersecurity issues will come up and there's going to be a lot of pressure on the few digital um, access channels that we have. The good thing is um, the banks have functional online um, response centers and based on our cybersecurity strategy in the country, all the banks have a cybersecurity dex. So as, as of now, anything that happens, customers still know where to call. And the central bank has done excellently well in, 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 in addressing um, redress based on the report that we have. Yes, about 16 million complaints have been addressed, recovering about 77 billion naira and over 21 million US dollars. So we have a very robust um, um, platform to handle redress. But the mm -hmm. challenge is people that are excluded will be unwittingly um, um, cut out of this. So it's basically to readjust our work based on what we are seeing here to be able to respond to this appropriately going forward. I will just stop here because of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for that very precise and incisive uh, intervention.
Um, I, I have a quick question to Stephen and also to uh, Moncolo and Setor on how do we ensure adequate liquidity to honor uh, cash out related requests at the agent outlets? Are you taking any specific measures? Are providers taking any specific measures? This is specifically given the fact that maybe going forward, uh, you know, cash transfer subsidies may be transferred through digital means and the cash outs could happen at the agent outlet. So how do we ensure that we have uh, agents have adequate liquidity uh, to honor uh, cash out requests at the outlets? Uh, what initiatives are happening in your respective countries? Brief responses, please. Thank you. Can I give yeah, a reference? Uh, uh, let, let us start with the lady here, uh, Monkolo, over to you. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, in fact, this has been one of the challenges that we've had in Zambia, the aspect of liquidity for, for the MNOs, even for these agents, especially in the remote areas. You know, people are able to send money, but to cash out has been a problem. And one of the interventions that we have put in place is that uh, the Bank of Zambia has got um, uh, sub chess in various parts of the country where and even just commercial banks that can be used as uh, places that can store up cash mm -hmm. and we hope that instead of uh, having the need to be transferring cash from lusaka which is the central we could have cash to nearby centers and uh, there are other initiatives unfortunately i don't think i'm so competent enough to answer this because uh my colleagues in the payment systems uh, departments are the ones who are working out, but I know there are measures to make sure that cash okay. is taken to far off uh, places where there are challenges to cash out. Yes. I, I, I see Miriam uh, from Bank of Zambia raising her hand. Uh, in the interest of time, may I request Miriam to type in her response as to what uh, Bank of Zambia is doing uh, in order to ensure uh, enough liquidity. Over to you, uh, Dr. Sethor, uh, a brief response uh, from your side, please, before we move. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it depends on each country's arrangement for ensuring that there's adequate liquidity. And actually, COVID-19 will expose that arrangement. Currently, in Ghana, we have a well-developed system whereby each region, we are what we call the territorial master agent, and then we have the super agent. These are group of big, big agents that help in the distribution of liquidity. So uh, currently, Accra and Kumasi, these are the two major cities, they are locked down. And what is happening is that the president has made it clear that all digital services providers are allowed to move around to ensure that there's enough liquidity at agent points. So. We have our agents that are opened, and then the super agents, the territorial uh, master agents are providing liquidity as required. So it is important all member countries have well laid out agent structure that will ensure liquidity. As my earlier colleague has said uh, from Zambia, in some countries, we know that liquidity is a major problem, especially in the remotest part of uh, those countries. But if incentive skills are built in the, the pricing, it will encourage merchants, uh, uh, Philly, uh, petrol stations, pharmaceutical shops to serve as master agents and super agents that will provide liquidity. Because these are people who get a lot of liquid resources. And without necessarily going to a bank, they can provide this liquidity to the agents in the rural area. I'm interested in the deprived areas. Okay. But in many cities, the branches are opened, so we don't have any issue of in terms of liquidity, because agents are providing the needed uh, liquidity support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, a three-sized response from you, please. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. So, so this is very interesting, because um, for us, we are just seven days into lockdown for these major cities that are mentioned. Um, Fixed location agents, one of the reasons why they are agents is because they have other um, kind of business they do that generate some liquidity and they're able to manage within that um, context. Of course, that's, that, that's hugely impacted now. So what the central bank has done is 
there's a 50 billion naira targeted credit facility for not just agents. Every SME that is doing business that has been affected or impacted by COVID-19 can access that um, particular facility. And on the physical side, the, the government has ramped up um, social benefit disbursement. You know, that is also forming as a source of liquidity for um, fixed um, um, location agent. Again, we're just seven days in this, and, and, and the locations we are looking at is not the entire country, but as things develop, we'll re-strategize and see how to address the, the liquidity issue. But it's definitely a business continuity concern that has not been wholly looked at in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, now we move to the final intervention pro from Professor Dirk Zetsche from the University of uh, Luxembourg. I request you to provide per perspectives from uh, developed and advanced market economies. What has worked and uh, what has failed? What are the learnings for emerging market economies? Or uh, as an opposite, what can advanced economies learn from what emerging economies are doing? Uh, over to you, sir, for your brief intervention, uh, Professor Dirk. Thank you very much, uh, Gies. Um, of course, in the first days uh, when the pandemic has reached Europe, everything was focusing on business continuity. And this is two facets. There's on the one hand, the private sector continuity. So here it was important to um, retain uh, that the call centers worked, uh, that the IT staff could go to work, regardless of the shutdown of the rest of the economy, um, that basically if there were people in the crucial IT supply or in the risk management supply um, affected by the crisis uh, that the substitutes uh, were coming in and uh, taking on the work properly. But there was also business continuity issues on the regulator side um, because um, they are also a large organization and here a lot of the regulators have opted into um, kind of telework, home office arrangements. Many more things work online right now than they would usually do. And of course, interviews and other stuff for fit and purpose tests will take place online. The other thing is um, that was happening was, of course, in the intermediate shock uh, to deal with the prudential capital. Um, there were some delays in calculating prudential capital. And uh, here, of course, the stress tests um, could be tested, whether they were adequately working. And of course, um, here, um, the regulators were keen on keeping the liquidity in the system. They imposed dividend bans and uh, bans to buy sharebacks, in particular in Europe, uh, or at least it is framed as strong recommendation, which is actually the same. And this brings us to the main concern. Next slide, please. Um, that basically European regulators were particularly concerned that the liquidity crisis that we experienced in 2007, 2008 um, would come again and they ensured to flood the market with excess liquidity. Uh, so liquidity is not the problem right now, um, but where does the liquidity flow? And that's the problem because the amount of goods that can be purchased are much less than before. Goods don't make it cross border. Um, many goods are not available due to government intervention. So you can't go to a restaurant, you can't fly, you can't consume. Uh, how you would only do. And that means, of course, there's too much liquidity on too few goods. And in the mid to long term, we would expe uh, expect inflation coming from that. Of course, in particular, the Eurozone could live with a bit of inflation. So that may be a risk worthwhile to take. But where are the problems? The problems comes that there's a whole part of the economy which doesn't benefit uh, from all the help. These are the entrepreneurs. Of course, the SMEs itself received some rental support payments and some support payments for the staff. But these firms are not reimbursed for the losses on the entrepreneurial activity. And that means the entrepreneurs themselves, they will suffer. And that will may bring them to the idea to shut down the business, not because um, they would incur major losses, but simply because it's not profitable. And why should you work if it's not profitable anymore? Another major concern that comes with uh, the current problem is the pension system. Um, there have been countries where the pension system have been underfunded, but for instance, for the US, we expect simply due to the shock and underfunding of $1 trillion, and we would expect other systems, in particular Australia, but also a number of other uh, 
uh, countries which have underfunded systems to feel this shock even further. Of course, you could think of it as a long-term versus short-term game, um, but here this is a concern that will, of course, lead to significant stress in the social systems uh, in the future. Let me quickly point out four things particularly interesting to the AFI community. First of all, um, the European authorities in particular took immediate action in the sense that they saw the risk for the consumers out of the crisis. So uh, there are strong recommendations out there against bundling and tying of products in the times of crisis, against hidden fees, uh, against excess interest rates, a kind of risk premium on interest rates. So the regulator really tries to, um, to enforce existing anti-fraud regulation and uh, also uh, to, to make sure that whatever contract is entered into now would also withstand the scrutiny of a very robust regulation scheme. But here the advantage is, in particular inside of Europe, it's a fairly strong legal framework already there protecting consumers. So there's a lot of legislation on which uh, this could be based without any type of additional supervisory action. Then uh, one aspect which is interesting is um, that in order to ensure sanitary health when it comes to payments and commerce, um, the limits for touchless pay for uh, deviations from uh, strong authorization and other types of security features, um, they have been raised in order to allow people to avoid cash payments. So for instance, uh, a personal signature is hardly required these days. Nothing, not for any commercial transaction and of course also not for payments. And the other thing is they try to avoid uh, people entering pin codes at the same station and so on. So every type of touch and anything that comes uh, to contact is um, uh, basically dealt with with a rather liberal view. So it seems to be that the crisis is time for building a new testing ground here. Online, of course, here in this regard, online payments, uh, we have to consider that in Europe, in particular, we have the single European payment area with a very harmonized, very low cost a payment system. And now this can be used in both ways. It can be used, of course, for wiring money from one account to the other, but also the government can use it to channel money uh, to the firms. And that is very important because right now speed matters. So the governments have, for the most part, tended to opt into an advanced pay ex post review manner. So SMEs in particular, they just have to file in the internet um, an application with their raw data and then they immediately get money and the bureaucracies will follow up on that, whether the preconditions for meeting, uh, for, for getting the money um, were already there in place. And if it's not, the money will be seized from the account. So here you can see that basically um, a, a, a payment system uh, that is harmonized can work both ways uh, to the benefit also to bring money back into the economy. Well, one concern that has become extremely obvious in the last weeks is that tech matters. It matters because no one wants to meet, so we cannot solve problems on the spot. So we have to solve them basically with a distance. But what does it mean? We, it, we entirely rely now on a technology, and this technology is under immense stress. Uh, let me just tell you what stress means. Stress doesn't mean that uh, it, the backbone doesn't work, something like that. But small pair, spare parts don't make it across border. You know, small stuff uh, that is somewhere in the global production chain, let me say from China or from the US, simply doesn't make it. Or the technician who would usually come over to train stuff, uh, how to install it, uh, can simply not make it from one city to the next. Yeah? So here, basically, um, the forced relocalization of the economy, forced, because if the borders are shut, uh, you kind of disrupt the service and production chain. This forced localization reveals uh, where the great dependency on global supply. Okay. Let me, before I stop, let me just stress one point. What is what we can learn from Europe? Well, um, we can learn from Europe that from my perspective, we need to find ways to support the entrepreneurs because those will be the people who bring up the economy and who maintain it. So simply providing liquidity is only one part of the solution. We also need to find direct ways to support the entrepreneurs, um, if only to keep their organization intact for a while. 
Um, the other thing is we need to open the borders for crucial supply and crucial supply has many ends. We are just talking about tech, but of course, let's also speak about simple stuff like uh, um, uh, like like grapes or like like anything in agriculture. Let's also think about it in in service supply. All of that will be very short and in, in high demand across the globe if we don't get the borders open at least for economic activity. And that may put a question mark to very radical steps. At least we need to make sure that people can survive because they can die of several reasons. The one is a sickness, the other is if we don't have agricultural products in the fall, um, then we will experience a crisis of a different sort. Both are humanitarian, but we should not sacrifice everything for the short-term gains because humanity hopefully lives on longer than just for the next one or two months. And these kind of long-term economic connections need to be taken definitely into account with whatever crisis action we are taking right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dirk, for that brief intervention. I think this, uh, your intervention also responds to uh, Francois' question. Francois from the Central Bank of Rwanda had this question on consumer protection aspects uh, related to digital finance uh, and digital financial services. Aspects such as uh, banning, I mean, limiting bundling of products, uh, hidden charges, and uh, Dr. Sethor also talked about uh, having moratorium for digital credit products and all, all these measures ensure that um, consumer protection market conduct related aspects are also really very important when we talk of uh, uh, digitization of financial services, actually. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, one question that I had for uh, uh, Professor Arner and Professor Dirk both was on, on, the, on the role of technology um, and uh, the good good things that it is doing. But on the flip side, uh, it is also getting very pervasive. Uh, we are talking about using uh, data location uh, for contact tracing, uh, so on and so forth. So it's intrusive nature, especially the level of personal and financial data that is shared or extracted can be risky. How do we ensure balance? How do we ensure proportionality? What is the approach uh, that, that is emerging and that should be taken. A very brief response from uh, Douglas first, and then maybe from Dirk later, please. Thank you. Yes, this is something that I think we think is one of the, the bigger issues going forward. Uh, as big tech gets increasingly bigger and ever more fundamental uh, and often increasingly linked with governments. And of course, I think one likely outcome of the current crisis is an increase in all of those factors. Certainly, that's what we've seen uh, in, in China. It's, it's what we're seeing in the US. It seems to be uh, a potential general direction. Mm -hmm. And I think we also have questions about an increasing divergence between different countries in terms of their approach to those issues. Uh, it may not be possible in years ahead to actually have a consensus on, on a single way forward. Uh, and this could end up being uh, a real source of, of fragmentation from the standpoint of globalization. Thank you, uh, Professor Arnott. Uh, Dirk, did you have anything to add to it? You're on mute, Dirk. So, oh, I'm sorry. So, first we need to all be sure what we can do before we decide what we want to do. Um, we could definitely result or uh, impose some very personalized supervision. So, we could track the individual, basically, maybe people who are in suspicion of having the virus. We can track them. We can basically ensure that every transaction that they're doing uh, can only take place within their confined space at home. So there is basically um, something we can be really a benevolent dictator about individuals. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do this? Well, this is a different, this is a different story. And uh, I think it has several kinds of truth. Of course, what makes sense is to use pseudonymized data to see whether certain um, contact prohibitions or curfews and so on work. Yeah, that makes sense. And there I don't see a major 
um, privacy issue, of course, pseudomized data can very often be tracked back into individual data and then it's not such big protection. But I think for general movement patterns, that's useful for policymakers to make good decisions. Um, the other aspect that I see as a concern is um, whether we really want to have 100% strict enforcement of uh, certain limitations to move. Um, of course, we all don't want the virus to spread. We don't want the virus to kill people. Uh, but there's also trade-off. Um, after all, these people that are confined to their homes, they're sick, but they're not criminals. And that mm -hmm. requires some balanced response uh, in light of the proportionality. And, and then okay. let's also think about individual fate, like okay. families that need to support each other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's a need to look at it in a proportional, uh, proportional manner. And even if measures are taken, they should be rather temporary and not uh, medium to long term nature. Uh, otherwise, this may be construed as being uh, rather negative in, from a personal uh, privacy standpoint. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have one uh, a quick question. Uh, uh, to to Moncolo and also to the other two regulators on the panel, uh, with with a lot of fund injection happening, uh, partic particularly in developing countries, do you see any inflationary consequences? This is a question from um, Mr. Habibur Rahman from Bangladesh Bank. Uh, Moncolo, over to you, and then to the other regulators. Brief thank answers, you. please. Uh, thank you so much, Gias, and. Um... For me, my view is that even as governments and central banks inject liquidity, it has to be done very cautiously. I'll give an example. In my country right now, our inflation has just escalated. Our currency has depreciated to unprecedented levels. Therefore, as the central bank, we had to strike a balance. We inject liquidity, and what will happen, there will be a spiral effect on inflation and foreign exchange, which will be very, very difficult again to address. So even as we provide liquidity, it is not free money. We have set criteria for our financial service providers. It has to be secured by collateral. So the institutions have to qualify to access that uh, liquidity support and it has to be collateralized. So it's not free money because we are very mindful of the effects. I think the message that we're sending out as the Bank of Zambia is for now, don't change the rules. Yes, when you need to modify to accommodate something that is threatening, move in and modify. Uh -huh. It may be too early to start changing the rules. We don't know how long this crisis will be. So we have to be very, very cautious, even as we take some of these measures that we are taking as such as injecting liquidity in the financial Thank sector. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sator, a brief answer from you, please. Uh, let's keep track of the time uh, we've already overshot. Yeah, uh, let me add that that is where the role of the central bank is very critical. As liquidity is injected into the system, the central bank must come with its tools to mop up those liquidity in a timely manner. And let me say that the critical challenge to Africa, especially developing countries, from my perspective, is no liquidity. It's the collapse in the commodity prices, especially countries that are exporting oil currently. We if you look at the oil prices before this crisis, even in the case of Zambia that my sister talked about, it is commodity prices, no injection of liquidity. Because in Africa, liquidity has always been a constraint. And I believe a good central bank, when liquidity is injected, either from the central bank point of view, from the fiscal point of view, monetary policy must be designed to mop up that liquidity. What we should be concerned really at this time, especially for developing countries, is the collapse in our commodity prices and the loss of jobs that are associated with this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, over to you, please. Yes, um, um, thank you very much. Regarding um, liquidity injection and, and, and inflation, um, just like I mentioned earlier, um, the central bank has been in the business of, of development finance for job creation and, and a lot of things. So our interventions are around 
um, providing sort of moratorium, you know, and reducing um, concerns for uh, reducing rates, interest rates um, um, for these particular MSMEs are already benefiting most of them from CBN. I think where our our challenge will lie is um, there there might be a fragmentation of the value chain, you know, and that's where the concern is. So it's not enough to to, to ease the credit burden of a particular um, MSME. But along the value chain, if it is not tightly coupled, you know, then it is going to be a concern. It's going to lead to job losses and it's going to lead to other um, concerns. So, so for us, it's basically identifying a solution that will address um, um, the entire value chain. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, those, uh, for that quick response. And my final question uh, is, um, uh, in terms of uh, partnering with the private sector, what what is that one practical advice that you give uh, to the stakeholders in terms of partnering uh, with the private sector stakeholders? Uh, Mankolo, let's start with you. And again, tweet-sized answers, less than 20 seconds. Start with you, Mankolo. Thank you. Thank you. Our private sector so far has been very supportive. I'll talk from the financial sector. A number of uh, initiatives that the central bank has uh, implemented were actual initiatives of the Bankers Association of Zambia. For instance, the few holidays that I'm talking about, some of, you know, freeing up some of the charges. So they've been very supportive, even just um, in uh, supporting their customers. That is one aspect. Number two, from the private sector again, as I said, COVID-19 came like a thief in the night. In the night. Governments did not plan for this. Governments did not have any fiscal resources for this. And on their own, the government could not have done what they have done today. But we have seen the private sector come in to support the government, and the support has been very overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Sato? 30 seconds. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, we respect to partnering the the, the private sector, I will advise that you engage, collaborate, and carry the private sector along in policy formulation and implementation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Stephen? Yes. Um, for, for, for me, it, it is inevitable. Um, we have perfect examples in, in, in Nigeria, just like um, Zambia as well. The, the, the partnership between um, the government and private sector in this term, the regulator and private sector in financial service. And we've seen a lot of very interesting initiatives um, um, over the years. And it is increasingly important to partner private sector. Take, for instance, remittances. You know, one of the, it, it is not just enough for the regulator to do certain things regarding sustaining the level of remittances because it's huge for Nigeria. For 2018, it was 24 billion US dollars, you know. It's the private sector that have gone ahead to start talking to their partners abroad regarding how to sustain remittances over this period. So it is really inevitable in, in, in this um, um, particular um, period. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dirk? Um, I think, uh, and we have to consider that, that this is all about humankind. And I think humankind needs to align its resources and we need to avoid uh, a local egotism to go through this crisis. And of course, open borders were a precondition for the success in the last decade in mitigating uh, the risks uh, for mankind. And I'm, I can just ask everyone to restrain uh, our overall ambition to deal with this crisis alone. I think this is uh, also a chance to cooperate and collaborate, to exchange knowledge, and uh, to find a common path towards the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Doug, over to you. Uh, uh, Douglas, over to you, please. Yeah, I think on, on, on that point, uh, the key is really uh, not to engage just with your traditional financial sector. Engage with, um, your telecoms providers, uh, your fintechs, your mobile money providers, uh, and that what we're seeing in a lot of places is, um, as, as some of the others have said, a lot of enthusiasm to actually help. Uh, and 
work with them, see what you can come up with and move forward. Because unless you have a system already built, you don't really have much choice. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. Uh, maybe a round of applause to all the uh, panelists uh, virtually from wherever you're seated. Uh, let us thank uh, the panelists. I would uh, conclude the, the webinar by summarizing in, a, in the next uh, two minutes. Um, COVID-19, as Moncolo says, is, a, is like a thief in the night. Uh, it has caught us uh, uh, off guard. Uh, this is a human crisis, which is uh, escalating to become a financial crisis. And as uh, Alfred says, uh, technology plays a, a very important role, especially within the context of uh, pro, you know, social distancing, enabling remote access to payments and financial services, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a need to focus on resilience of digital payments infrastructure. And there's also a need to uh, look at restructuring of loan facilities, fee payment holidays, and uh, so on and so forth from an MSME perspective. Um, the, the consumer protection aspects also come into play when, um, when using increasing digital uh, infrastructure to offer payments and financial services. Um, so finally, uh, we acknowledge and we recognize that uh, Many of the questions went uh, unanswered uh, due to the paucity of time. We apologize for that. This is a good reason uh, to continue having this conversation uh, going forward. And with that note, I would like to uh, conclude the webinar uh, on a positive and hopeful note. And I would conclude it uh, by reading my kid's book, uh, which is very appropriate, appropriately named, Oh, The Places We Go by Dr. Seuss. I will take 30 seconds to read. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to, brainy, to people as brainy and footsie as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along, you'll start happening too. So with this positive th thought, I would like to thank uh, the panelists and also to the participants for being very patient. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay healthy and stay connected. Thank you so much. Uh, goodbye for now and have a good day or a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aliki. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye.